Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to ACNS webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our honorable guest from the UAE, Dr. Mohammad Al Asha. Dr. Asha is an assistant professor of neurosurgery at the University of UAE and chief of neurosurgery department at the Tawam Hospitals. He has completed his uh, specialized fellowships in open and endoscopic skull based surgery from the UK, France, and Canada, as well as neuro oncology from Canada. He is a senior consultant of skull base and neuro oncology and has special interest in spinal cord tumors and craniocervical tumors, including complex spine fixations. He has multiple publications and keen interest in clinical research. He is head of skull base committee for the Arab Neurosurgery Board and member of several international societies. We are extremely honored to have him today at the webinar and today he will be talking about expanded endoscopic skull based surgery. Are we losing grounds for keyhole open surgery? The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from Japan, Prof. Yohei Hokama. Prof. Hokama is an instructor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Graduate School of Medicine University at the Ryukyu Uehara, Okinawa Islands. He is a board certified neurosurgeon from the Japanese Neurosurgical Society and also the Japan Board of Cancer Therapy. His clinical expertise is focused on cerebrovascular and neuro oncology, and we are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars. And today he will be talking about pre operative structural planning and dynamism of white matter bundles. The chair for the first session of today is our honorable faculty from Japan, Prof. Masamichi Kurosaki. Prof. Kurosaki is the professor in the Division of Neurosurgery at the Department of Brain and Neurosciences, Totori University, Faculty of Medicine, Japan. He has a vast experience in the management of skull based tumors, especially treating tumors of pituitary gland endoscopically. He is a member of Japanese Endocrine Society, Japanese Society of Skull Based Surgery, and Japan's Japanese Society of Pituitary and Hypothalamic Tumors. He has published several articles in various period journals, and we are extremely grateful to him for accepting an invitation to chair of today's webinar. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honorable guest from Argentina, Prof. Maximiliano Nunes. Dr. Nunes is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Hospital El Cruz, Forecio Valera, Buenos Aires, Argentina. After his training in neurosurgery, he has completed his rotations in several world renowned places like with Professor Rotten, Professor JFM, and Professor Dafau. He has an excellent neurosurgeon who specializes in micro neurosurgical techniques in the management of complex brain stem tumors and cerebrovascular diseases. He has received several honors and prizes for his outstanding contribution to neurosurgical academics in his country and we are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, shares and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this podium to our first chair, Prof. Masamichi Kurosaki. So now, uh, it's truly an honor to chair this session. Uh, I will introduce, uh, my name is Kurosaki from Tottori University, Japan. I will introduce Professor Mohamedo Asha from UAE. He's uh, uh, specialized in uh, skull based surgery. Uh, now, he, uh, today he will be talking about expanded endoscopic skull based surgery. Uh, please, Dr. Professor Asha. Thank you very much. And I really apologize. I had made the promise to the kids to take them out, and uh, I thought I could do two things at the same time, but didn't notice the battery on my laptop is actually uh, getting in red now. So, uh, again, I'm very grateful to the professors. I would like to uh, tell you about uh, expanded skull base uh, surgery. I trained in the UK and I was fortunate to work with uh, Fred Gentili in Toronto. And um, I, over the years, I've been uh, fortunate also to have different uh, type of cases where my practice has uh, evolved uh, to include a variety of endoscopic and endoscopic assisted approaches. So um, I work in a national uh, tertiary referral center in uh, United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi. It's called Tawam. And we get a variety of uh, complex uh, cases. So um, I practice all of these and uh, I have interest in orbital uh, surgery as well. So um, the group from Pittsburgh have... Uh, spoken about expanded approaches in terms of sagittal and coronal planes and we're all familiar with all of these um, the concept of the coronal plane i think should evolve to include orbital surgery as well 
as an additional expanded approach in the coronal plane. Um, and this is cadaveric work, but we can all imagine the um, uh, wonderful uh, uh, approaches that one can achieve through expanded endoscopic surgery. Uh, and uh, Scott is, uh, Mr. Scott is a, a gynecologist and obstetrician from the United Kingdom. And he has spoken about the um, uh, evolution and maybe demise of different surgical techniques, different philosophies that come into fashion very quickly and widely adopted by many uh, clinician, uh, then we notice that at some point they reach a climax where everyone is uh, adopting these approaches, perhaps people who are not even well trained and well familiar with these approaches. Then there is a rapid decline in these approaches uh, and these techniques, uh, and it may disappear completely. It may remain at a very limited base, or it may uh, come to a plateau to a point where there is a, um, a small minority that still continue to do them. And usually we find these are the people who are actually the most skilled uh, in this area. So thinking about that, are we witnessing the downsloping phase of um, endoscopic? I'm talking about expanded endoscopic skull base. I'm not talking about hypophysectomies and simple endoscopic procedures. Um, so is there any change in the trend? And if we look at this publication from only last year, it's from Al Mifti Group. And here they are talking about, uh, in their experience, the indications for open transcranial approaches for pituitary adenomas. So here, they're not even talking about complex pathology, meningiomas, sarcomas, uh, craniopharyngiomas, etc. Uh, they are talking about uh, maybe large pituitary adenomas, what they thought in their experience is an indication to transcranial. And all of these, if you look at it in a different way, for them, it's a relative contraindication uh, for expanded endoscopic approaches. And maybe some of us will read this and will be a little bit surprised that for me, this is not a really a true contraindication and I would not change to an open transcranial approach. I think there isn't right and wrong, there isn't black and white, and it all depends on the surgeon's experience. Osama al Mifti is a great microsurgical uh, a neurosurgeon, um, and he probably did not adopt the endoscopic uh, techniques fully or at a very late stage. So um, is that just an isolated opinion? You will find that no other surgeons as well have um, spoken about a trend towards adopting open transcranial approaches for specific ones. And here we find that uh, Teddy Schwartz has spoken about their experience with maybe olfactory groove meningiomas, where in their hands and their analysis, they found open approaches are perhaps better. Um, so the, um, the specification and case selection has started earlier, where people, uh, uh, same group again with Teddy Schwartz, they spoke about uh, certain... Uh, anterior skull based meningiomas, if there is a cuff of the brain with edema and invasive, uh, that they found the results of endoscopic skull based surgery perhaps inferior to open ones because you are uh, causing some sort of injury to the brain and you could avoid that or minimize it uh, using um, minimally uh, open or open techniques. And um, uh, the same theme continues with other uh, 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 surgeons. But it's not all very gloomy. We find that even recent literature, um, when we compare uh, these many open, such as eyebrow incision, for example, for tuberculum cell meningioma with expanded endoscopic, that there are still some advantages for the expanded endoscopic. In fact, the visual outcome uh, is better with expanded outcome, according to uh, this uh, review. And... Um, also, we have to think about the philosophy of uh, endoscopic, uh, 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 expanded endoscopic approaches that approaching the skull base lesion from below, uh, other than the fact that there isn't any manipulation of the brain, the fact that there isn't any cranial incisions as such, you are achieving immediate and early devascularization. 
by default, we are resecting the dural attachment. So for meningiomas, for example, we are achieving Simpson grade one in every case, uh, provided that you can resect the uh, lesion itself and not leave anything behind. And uh, we've seen the visual outcomes are better. And with the improvement of techniques and technology and experience, we are managing many challenges such as CSF leak, vascular encasement, and uh, 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 things that Osama al Mifti group, for example, put as relative contraindication. So, um, without further ado, I would like just to um, uh, 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 suggest that the issue of uh, endoscopic versus mini open uh, should be tailored uh, to case by case and should be always considered in terms of the available uh, uh, resources experience and techniques. And if we look here at the uh, first contraindication from the earlier paper, the issue of surgical approach, let's call it, pneumatization and the surgical approach itself. Uh, and we have here a good example of this. So this is a child who was about three years old at the time. She had the supracellar tumor, very heterogeneous. On CT scan, there wasn't any obvious uh, 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 calcifications as such. Uh, this was thought to be uh, possibly germ cell tumor, but also the other option was um, craniopharyngioma. She was sent to me to uh, consider perhaps a biopsy because all CSF blood serum were inconclusive and um, they wanted a biopsy. Uh, and I thought perhaps we could have a combined approach where a biopsy can be incorporated in the actual procedure. And if it's germ cells, we can stop. And if it is craniopharyngioma, we have to continue. Uh, and um, here, I did not feel that the endoscopic approach is the correct one, not because the cella is small and the sinuses are not pneumatized. I think that's, in my hand, not a contraindication. Reality is, it is incredibly difficult to manage a three-year-old uh, with complex skull base repair, uh, and if they have CSF leak, you cannot expect them not to cough, sneeze, and have nasal packing or lumbar drain. And to keep them sedated, ventilated for several days carries significant risk. So I've chosen a different approach. In this one, I've chosen a supraorbital eyebrow incision. And as you can see, we were able to get gross total resection and the arrow points at the optic chiasm, this child came with rapidly deteriorating vision and her vision re remarkably improved after surgery. And that's her a uh, couple of days after surgery. She's still in hospital um, and she's done very well. The histology was craniopharyngioma. Um, however, if we have another example where the corridor is very small and this is a cripriform uh, anterior ethmoidal cell tumor, uh, in a young girl whose father is my colleague in hospital. Uh, she presented with a sodium problem and she was diagnosed to have syndrome of inappropriate ADH and no obvious reason she had image on her brain and incidentally was found to have this tumor. So uh, my ENT colleagues said that they can only approach it through an open approach like lateral rhinotomy in a 20-year-old female that was not very appealing. And we thought we could get there despite the very narrow corridor endoscopically. And that is the lateral rhinotomy uh, from a different case that I was involved in. And you can see, although the suturing might be reasonable, it's still a very destructive and difficult operation to accept for a female. And this is what we have done for this lady. So it's a single uh, 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 nostril approach. Uh, minimally invasive, only a small mucosa flap was raised. But because your corridor is very narrow, you need to work on a wide front. You need to have an expanded uh, view to realize where is the skull base and be able to reach to the most anterior ethmoidal cell to the cripriform plate uh, also safely without injuring the skull base from another area. Because the, the problem is, as surgeons, we... We know the anatomy very well, but sometimes difficult to imagine the 3D anatomy that the skull base, ventral skull base, is not a plane. It's actually a 3D structure. So we opened the maxilla, we opened the sphenoid, and we worked retrogradely 
to reach the most anterior. You can see the navigation here. And actually, this is a short video that I'll show you that once the concept is clear in your mind, I hope it's working, it's still buffering. Once the concept is clear in your mind, um, it is very easy to achieve in block resection, which was done in this case. So I'll just uh, skip this video because I think it's uh, not working for some reason. Okay, so until this continues, the second point is uh, olfactory groove meningiomas. Um, with olfactory groove meningiomas, the debate perhaps is um, um, is a little bit more uh, uh, evidence based. We have quite a big literature now about the problems. Uh, you, st you can still see my presentation. Yes. Okay. So. Um, the issue that many in discovered skull based surgeon did not pay attention to initially was a quality of life. And there is good evidence that if you remove the sensation of smell from somebody who has intact smell, you do affect their quality of life severely. So really for me, it, the sense of smell is a big determining factor. The second determining factor is the size of the olfactory groove meningioma. Uh, if the olfactory groove meningioma is huge, then you, there is no point doing a big defect from below because even if you repair it very well, we have seen cases of frontal lobe herniation and sagging uh, with significant serious problems. So I do prefer to keep that approach only for small to medium size in cases where there isn't a, 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 a good olfactory a, a sensation. So patient who has lost it completely or severely that it does not make much difference to them. Otherwise, I would uh, think of open approach. Now, the issue of brain invasion, we can see here, this is an example of olfactory meningioma. There is some edema in the frontal lobe. This patient in particular had no sense of smell at all. And this is a small or a medium size. So uh, to me, this looks like a good uh, candidate for endoscopic. It's not the same patient. This is a different patient. Uh, but you can see that the eye uh, uh, brow approach is is very feasible. Um, maybe we can debate about the cosmetic results. Is it acceptable or not? This lady was very happy with it. We could not make her scar within the eyebrow because these are tattooed eyebrows. These are not real. And uh, I think when you have real hair, you can always uh, uh, hide it within the hair. And if that doesn't look good, patient can have a tattoo drawn. But uh, my experience with making incision in a tattoo are not very good. Um, so this is what we've done for the uh, scan that we have shown. And you can see that with good technique, you can always peel off the meningioma in block without uh, really causing injury to the brain. And we can see the frontal lobe, although it looked edematous and invaded, it's actually quite pristine. And here the repair with multi-layer inlay with fascia lata and with the uh, uh, vascularized nasoceptal flap, and there is no CSF leak. Um, another case where there is a calcification, and again, this patient had a severely compromised sense of smell, uh, maybe for other reasons, because the size does not explain it, but she had heavily calcified um, uh, meningioma with a thick uh, uh, cribriform plate, and the crista gully was very thick as well. So some people consider this as a contraindication. I don't think it's a true contraindication and there is some evidence in literature that even hyperostatic meningiomas can have good results with endoscopic technique. And this video hopefully is working. So the trick always with these cases is not to make a huge defect and making a custom-made tailored approach and then circumferential dissection around. You can always get away with a, a smaller uh, uh, um, uh, opening for your meningioma. And we can see the type of instruments that might help you here, you need double angle to reach very anteriorly to the planum and maybe going to the crib reform uh, plate. And uh, here we have uh, seen early devascularization of the tumor bed. Then it's a circumferential uh, resection of the dura itself. 
And that's why we say in endoscopic cases, you can always get a Simpson grade one. If you are able to remove the tumor, you have already removed its attachment. And it is quite interesting because as you can see, people used to think about endoscopic as pulling surgery. So you are pulling from below. That's not true. Um, techniques have evolved and we can do pretty much like microsurgery, sharp dissection, and we can use micro scissors or whatever tools that you have to separate the different layers. And here we see sharp dissection, cutting the arachnoid uh, attachments with the brain. And uh, if I show you the uh, end results after circumferential uh, resection of the um, uh, uh, meningioma, you can see that's an artery from the frontopolar branch and it has been coagulated and now it is sharply dissected. So it's not a pulling surgery anymore and we can see that the tumor coming in block but also most importantly we can see that the brain this is where the attachment was otherwise looks very healthy and is not traumatized. So you can always do these operations through a minimally inv invasive open approach through an eyebrow or supraorbital uh, craniotomy um, uh, LCO uh, but um, uh, it's an option and a valid option to have them endoscopically. When we talk about tuberculum cell meningioma, things are uh, uh, much more complex because it's not only the size and the smell, there are several factors that determine their feasibility and the safety and the outcome. We're talking about consistency, about relationship to vascular structure, about relationship to optic chasm, and about relationship to the infundibulum and optic stoke, and about also the uh, uh, far lateral extension beyond the ICA cavernous sinus and maybe going to middle cranial fossa. So this is a case where it looked as a small uh, uh, tubercum cellimin in geoma. Uh, it's not really uh, invading the cavernous sinus. It's respecting the carotid and maybe a very good candidate. But the problem here is I could not decide its relationship to the optic can. Is this Pre-chasmatic, is it retrochasmatic? Even with the most delicate MRI sequences, it was really a puzzle. And for me, for tubercum salimin in geoma, the only true contraindication in my hands to do it endoscopically is if it is truly retrochasmatic. I, I, I don't like to brush the chasm every time I come in and out. So uh, I was about to refuse to do this endoscopically, but then um, we have... Uh, uh, now um, some modern tools that gives you a 3D anatomical segmentation and we've done that in this case and after studying it very carefully I was almost convinced that uh, in this case it actually was pre-chasmatic and maybe slightly overflowing above the chasm so made the decision and operated in this lady through an endoscopic approach and we can see here the uh, imprint of the optical carotid recess bilaterally, the tuberculum, and here we are drilling beyond the tuberculum. Uh, and that's always very important that you need to come more anterior so you have better control on the supracellular component uh, from outside rather than working from below. And here the intercavernous sinus is being coagulated, as we can see, and cut. And that's always a very important step because it can bleed really heavily. Uh, in this case, the meningioma was soft, so it was nicely suckable, which is a reward. You don't always get that kind of uh, rewarding meningiomas in every case. And we can see even the most lateral uh, parts. You can work with angled scopes and you can um, uh, 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 remove them without necessarily making a huge opening. Uh, what I would like to show you in this video is uh, how the optic chasm and the structures look inside. And here we are. So the arachnoid is intact on these structures. It's not touched. We see the ICA termination, MCA, and anterior cerebral arteries. The pituitary stoke is there. The optic chasm is there. The pituitary gland has not been touched. We did not need to open the cella. This is purely supracellar. And we can see the ACOM complex there. So it is a very safe operation when... Um, you have all the right components and done uh, well. And we can see that this patient had very nice vascularized septal flap post-op. She went home and she was okay. Now, this is a different example where 
it's largely a cystic tumor. Um, and again, the relationship with the optic care, uh, in this case, I was more confident that it is truly retrochiasmatic. And we can see that from the axial images there, that this is truly retrochiasmatic uh, lesion from arising from the interpeduncular cistern. And here I refuse to do it endoscopically, although this young man um, has heard about endoscopic technique and came asking for one. And I did not do it also through a, 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 um, an eyebrow frontal orbital. And you can see the reason his frontal sinus is quite big. So it's not a good idea to open the frontal sinus, although you can prepare it, etc. But you still end up with all the issues of infection and CSF leak, etc. And for no added value. So I did this through a, um, a, a, an orbitozygomatic uh, modified smaller incision. And I did that in order to have good control over the perforators of the basilar and the uh, oculomotor nerve in the interpeduncular system. And you can see we are working here through the Dolling triangle. And this was very interesting. This was actually extraventricular colloid cyst. Um, and you can see the colloid material coming out. Uh, so this was a remarkable case. And actually, we were able to do a full resection. It was very safe, smaller approach. And you can see the cosmetic results on the 3D uh, uh, reconstruction is very uh, well uh, uh, accepted. And even the uh, supraorbital uh, uh, notch of the nerve is still intact. So this patient, again, had a good result. One contentious issue is the issue of fibrous and solid uh, tuberculum cell meningioma. The question is, how do we tell before surgery that such meningioma is a solid and fibrous one? Is there any clues? We always talk about T2 and having iso-intense or uh, hypo-intense or hyper-intense uh, meningiomas. Unless it is very obviously hyper-intense, you cannot really get much information. So people have now developed uh, machine learning models to try to uh, use elastograms, elastography, ultrasound scan, etc. But still in clinical practice, that's not widely available. So we are still looking at T2 and at CT scan to see if there is any hint from calcification and the pattern of, of uh, uh, contrast enhancement. But having the, these fibrous ones makes life difficult. And this is an example of uh, a meningioma that was very fibrous and it has been done endoscopically. My section is over the area of the internal carotid artery. And what you need to do is really sharp incisions all the way around to separate this meningioma from the cavernous sinus wall, the medial cavernous sinus wall. Otherwise, uh, if you start pulling, you're going to end up with severe uh, trauma. And here you can see how uh, tough this tumor is. In fact, actually, in this case, I used the ultrasonic aspirator. And um, once you've done that and you've done a little bit of internal debulking, you can do circumferential dissection of the arachnoid and you um, can work around it in the corridor between the tumor and the cavernous sinus. And then uh, at some point that would allow you to dissect it and to preserve the structures behind uh, the um, uh, tumor. So here we have the patty and we're doing a counter dissection with the patty. Uh, the tumor can come in block and the structures inside looked actually pretty much quite decent. Here is a surgery cell, and that's the optic chasm. There, I, th I think there is a zoom-in picture. And here we um, look inside, and we can see the internal cerebral artery. And this is here, if the picture is clear, uh, this is the pituitary stoke. So really, we have a clear view of the pituitary stoke, and we're working above the pituitary gland. And this is the gentleman who has significant improvement in his vision. What about the issue of having narrow corridor between the two carotid surgery? It has been considered a, a relative contraindication. I, I do agree if it, the distance is less than five millimeter, there is probably very little point in trying. But if you have something like this and you, you, you feel that you can get good control and you have good angiogram to show that anterior communicating artery is, is there and posterior communicating artery is there in case you have a carotid issue. 
You have to be honest with the patient about the risk of vascular injury. But this patient was very motivated for endoscopic uh, surgery. And we went ahead and decided to do it endoscopically. You can see visual evoke potentials being used, which I use routinely in cases where the optic nerve is encased by the tumor. It does not really prevent the injury. It does give you sometimes a good idea, but it's a rough uh, training, uh, a screening tool. It's not very accurate. There's a few minutes, maybe two or three minutes delay until you get the averaging of visual evoke potential, unlike the SCCP, which takes maybe 30 seconds. So here is the post-op scan, and you can see the window is exactly the same like what we measured on the pre-op scan, and we were able to get a gross total resection What's the trick in these cases? The trick is to have a vertical opening of the dura, not to open horizontally, and to work only in uh, the midline and to try to dissect the tumor from within, then go to the sides. And this is the final uh, result of that tumor. So the, it, it, it's a vertical incision, midline, uh, debulking of the tumor, then working circumferentially around it, with a combination of blunt and sharp dissection and getting the tumor uh, separated from the uh, cavernous sinus. And we can see now this tumor still uh, going to the uh, right side more, which um, uh, uh, we have seen in the scan. And uh, we uh, now are working on the tumor gradually to try to bring it out. And now it is in block um, coming out in one piece. Uh, but I would like to show you inside uh, how we are looking at the... That's still a little bit of the tumor and the attachment anteriorly. So as I said, you do not need to resect all the dura. You can work with angled instruments and angled microscope to try to remove this. And you can see these structures still looks very, very well preserved. There isn't really an injury. So... It's, um, it's a matter of being always conscious what's on the other side and not pulling blindly and trying to do a microsurgical uh, dissection, even when you use the endoscope. So um, this is the patient and she had good improvement after surgery. This is a challenging case that I actually um, was operating under the impression this is just a macro adenoma. And I prepared my technique and my approach um, the same. So here I'm, I'm approaching this as a pituitary macroadenoma and I'm making my cuts in the dura and doing extra capsular dissection. And you can see in a minute now uh, I'm using the coagulation with Aquamentis uh, to give me more exposure and stop some bleeding. And now we start seeing the tumor. There is a horizontal separation between the tumor, which is superior and the gland, which is the orange color inferior. And that separation was a true anatomical separation. So there was a plane between the two. I opened this tumor thinking it's an adenoma and I'm going to suck it out. Uh, in fact, it was very fibrous. And even with uh, piecemeal removal, I was not able. So immediately I realized I'm dealing with something else. I'm dealing with a supracellar a tumor that's not arising from the pituitary gland and is not having consistency of the pituitary gland. So in fact, uh, uh, this, uh, I think, uh, is a meningioma. Um, um, now, here we, I'm expanding the approach. I'm doing tuberculum cell uh, approach and a little bit of planum. And you can see there is a plane, completely uh, obvious plane between the pituitary gland and this tumor. And um, the, the point was you need to do a little bit of um, uh, uh, debulking. And here we are using the CUSA, the ultrasonic aspirator doing central debulking of this tumor in order to allow us to mobilize it without causing any uh, significant stress on the adjacent structures. This is, again, the uh, diathermy, the aquamentis, and it's an important tool to reduce blood uh, loss, but also to shrink the tumor and can be used safely in these areas. And you can see here, once we have done more debulking, now the tumor is completely mobile and separate, separable from the uh, pituitary gland. So we are able to mobilize it, lift it up, and find that it is completely detached from the gland. We can see the pituitary stalk behind. And maybe in a glimpse, if you can see it later, uh, also we were able to see the basilar artery behind the tumor. So this tumor is completely supracellar 
and it's probably a cellular meningioma uh, coming from the diaphragma. It, it, it is not uh, arising from the pituitary gland itself. So there is a piecemeal removal, uh, cutting portions of it with the CUSA, and uh, sorry, and then um, maybe the, just the last view of this um, operation. Uh, here we can see after the removal of the tumor um, that the pituitary stalk that was stretched severely. This is the basilar artery, optic chasm. Uh, this patient had severe visual deterioration before surgery, and he actually has achieved a very good recovery after that. So the issue of having dumbbell shape tumor has always been a challenge, uh, and people have a proposed staged approach doing the inferior part through an endoscopic surgery and maybe doing a transcranial approach or uh, 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 interhemispheric uh, trans uh, 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 um, callosal or uh, translaminar terminalis or whatever other open approach you can do. And even these ones, you can still get them through expanded endoscopic approaches. The idea is you have to draw a line somewhere. And for me, the line is the foramen of Monroe, where if the tumor has extended through the foramen of Monroe, I would not try endoscopic approach. Um, and if the tumor uh, uh, has um, uh, obvious characteristics that makes it, for example, uh, are, uh, attached to brainstem, I will not also try endoscopic approach. So in the case that we have seen, there is none of the um, other contraindications I'm thinking about. And this tumor has presented itself to the sphenoid sinus. So there is a large component in the sphenoid sinus. And the trick, again, as I said earlier, is to come very anteriorly. So you need to do a transplanar approach for this one, not only transtubercular, because that will give you control on the most superior and most anterior part of the tumor. So you can come in front of the tumor through lamina terminalis, open that, and that would give you better control on the part inside the third ventricle. And here we're cutting the intercavernous sinus, as we did in an earlier uh, video and all the part that's inferior has been removed and now here we're coming anterior and that 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 membrane is the lamina terminalis and we can see that we have worked through the lamina terminalis using micro doppler is always very important because i'm going to cut the attachment to the cavernous sinus now so i'm checking that it's safe to do so and now it's being coagulated and in a second we will uh, sharply cut it and the other side is also coagulated and a sharp dissection of that component. Uh, so it's um, an operation that based on step-by-step -step concepts. And once you have uh, freed the part attached to the cavernous sinus and dissected the part in the third ventricle, it's a matter of rolling the tumor out. So you really is fold the capsule of the tumor after central debulking and trying to get it out of the nose sometimes is a challenge on its own and you can see even with all the debulking this tumor was i think the residual part was more than three centimeter and this is the view that you get into third ventricle which is amazing we can see both foramen of monroe and i think under the patty is the cerebral aqueduct uh, which is a good practice to flush that from any blood clot because uh, having a high flow fistula with blocked ventricles is not a good comp combination. So uh, this patient had um, a pneumocephalus after, but otherwise no issues. Um, I'm going to skip this case, but the point here is um, we spoke about the retrochasmatic, and for me, that's a contraindication. However, when you have a tumor like this with a reversed angle, um, you would um, expect that um, the tumor itself will lead you to the uh, retrochasmatic component. In fact, I was wrong in this occasion because when operated first, uh, I could not see the small nodule that was embedded in the third ventricle and it did not come down. So after I finished surgery, I discovered that I still have a nodule there when I did the post-op imaging. So the second day, I brought the patient back and I did a, a quick uh, uh, operation where I knew where to look. It was uh, immediately inside the third ventricle. So this is a trans lamina terminalis and here the, that has been opened and I'm dissecting the tumor 
uh, which has um, now come out in one piece. We can see uh, the same view that we have seen earlier. I think that's uh, the view inside the third ventricle with the cerebral aqueduct. So um, it's not always easy for these reverse angle supracellular tumors. You may need to do it staged or you may need to do intraoperative images. Even with angled scope, I could not see the residual nodule. In fact, it was very easy the next day because of the CSF loss that happened. It has descended down. Um, what about ICA uh, 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 extending lateral to ICA or cavernous sinus invasion? And we remember Amin Qassam group, uh, how they classified approaches through pterygopalatine and lateral to cavernous sinus. And this is such an example where we can see that the carotid is buried completely um, in this uh, tumor, especially on the left side. And there is also a blip of the tumor that has gone through the oculomotor triangle um, to maybe the uh, middle fossa. And here is the cavernous sinus invasion that goes all the way posteriorly. So uh, it's a quite challenging case. And um, uh, here what we need to do is uh, work through the cavernous sinus and work through the oculomotor triangle. And we have to be mindful uh, uh, not to stretch too much because there are delicate structures uh, from uh, small arteries that can uh, snap and that would be catastrophic. But you can reach to the middle cranial fossa through that approach. And this is a view where the um, nasoceptal flap over the clivus is split in the middle to allow you to go down to the clivus and to um, prepare your vascularized uh, pictures. So uh, we have seen the post-operative images here. Uh, this patient had a gross total resection. Even the part that was going through the cavernous sinus, we were able to retrieve it. It was a soft tumor, and he has done very well. Uh, I repaired these with uh, multi-layer uh, repair and with vascularized flap, also with fat, and I use balloon follies and lumbar drain. So I, I have increased layer by layer every year I worked. And I got to the maximum and kept maximum repair in every case because I always feel if I've done everything I can first time, I will not regret it if CSF leak happens again. But the problem is, if your best fails, then what else can you do? It's still a challenge. In this case, we can see, um, a, 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 I think this was an, a, a, an anaplastic meningioma, and it has uh, wrapped itself around the optic nerve on the right side. It has extended. Um, uh, 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 and destroyed the um, anterior clinoid and um, the lateral extension shows the challenge or the true challenge that even with expanded approaches anything lateral to mid pupillary line is extremely difficult to get even if you put a draft three approach with it you still cannot go to the extreme lateral approaches and this is what happened in this case was able to remove pretty much all the tumor except the most lateral part on the right side that remained, and this patient was referred for radiotherapy, but he's done very well overall. And um, doing these approaches, you need to have multidisciplinary team. I work without ENT because I, I had dual training in skull-based rhinology as well as skull-based neurosurgery, um, but um, you still need interventional neuroradiologists here, we, one of these cases, we need to do balloon occlusion test in case we add vascular injury in the carotid. We wanted to know that we can deal with it. And you need, obviously, an MDT that includes ophthalmology and endocrine. The patient that I've seen in your picture, he was blind in one eye, and immediately after the surgery, he was able to, to see. So his... His right eye was was completely blind, no light perception, and now he's got some light perception. He can count fingers. Obviously, it's still very weak, but that's better. And just to tell you about these complications and how you should be prepared, this is a case I've done recently, and it looked like one, maybe not the most challenging case. And what's happened is during the procedure with sharp dissection, I injured the medial carotid wall. I was able to pack it very effectively and bleeding stopped, took the patient for IR and I found there is no uh, 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 subarachnoid hemorrhage because there is a carotid cavernous fistula. So that fistula 
we tried with all the available endovascular techniques to seal it. Uh, they put coils and they put then flow diverter, uh, etc. But they could not um, because of all the anticoagulation was required, was not also safe. Uh, so eventually, uh, this patient we had done uh, angiogram before. We know that she had a good uh, collateral flow. So we've done a, a occlusion of the carotid on that side and she tolerated the procedure very well. Obviously, the injury happened before I was able to remove the tumor. So waking up the patient after the coiling and did full exam examination, she was fully intact and asked her what she wants us to do. And she said, you should go back and remove the tumor. So day four, we took her back to OR and we removed the tumor. And this is the lady. Um, she's doing very well. Obviously, she's living with one carotid, but that's well tolerated so far. So these approaches are not an adventure, are not something that you should try and see ha what happens. They come after long experience and they come after long consideration, honest discussions with the patient and maybe presenting statistics about your results. And the ultimate challenge is something like this, a case where there is a huge extension in the coronal and in the sagittal plane. And you can see all the structures in the cavernous sinus, even terminal carotid are buried within this tumor. Initially, it was thought to be adenoma, but looking more carefully at it, you can see dural tail and biphasic enhancement. This actually is a very fibrous and solid uh, tumor. It's a meningioma. This girl is a horse riding a trainer. She trains kids to ride horses and she has her own school, and she could not ride horses for a few months because she developed double vision. She had other hormonal issues, and she was very depressed. And the case has been discussed widely with everyone, and eventually I thought we can... Um, I think we can uh, uh, offer her uh, a endoscopic approach, and... In fact, that needed extensive neuromonitoring of all the cavernous sinus cranial nerves. And here we're building small steps, so middle turbinectomy, then doing medial maxillotomy, raising a nasoceptal flap, and doing a wide septostomy, and then opening the maxillary sinus, pterygopalatine, sphenoid sinus. So you need a wide exposure of the ventral skull base, then heavy coagulation of the uh, 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 dural origin um, and then we start from the safest area which is the middle and debulk it here is the carotid on both sides is exposed and you, we can see going down to the paraclival carotid and exposing that part to get proximal control if we have an injury and we started with the central part which is very fibrous doing central debulking with sharp dissection pituitary rongers but also CUSA and at some point, when you feel that you removed enough from the middle, now we are opening lateral to the carotid on the right side. So we're opening transcavernous approach, two suction technique into the cavernous sinus. And at some point, we see a structure that we thought is a nerve. So we use neurostimulator, and that confirmed this is the sixth nerve. And this is the paraclival carotid drilling, just to get control when we reach very deep. And the picture. Now we're seeing the abducent nerve, and here is a zoom in. We see the carotid siphon and the, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this is the abducent nerve here. And uh, this is the schematic diagram, and this is where it is uh, inside there. So the cavernous sinus on this side was cleared more or less. And then we move to the left side. We do the same steps, and um, piece by piece, we remove the tumor, and we start to find the carotid that was uh, narrowed from the long-standing stenosis of um, or compression of the tumor, and uh, that uh, uh, completed the cavernous part uh, uh, resection. And now we're removing the wall itself of the cavernous sinus, so resecting the anterior and the medial wall because it's heavily infiltrated by tumor. And we do it on the left side. Then we move to the central part again, and we take the retrocellular and supracellular component, and we've completed this. We can see the basilar bifurcation and brainstem behind us. Then the final part is the medial and anterior cavernous wall on the right side. And uh, that has been 
removed. And now we're cutting anterior to the carotid to do it safely. We do a two instrument technique. We put uh, an instrument behind to separate it from the uh, a knife and we cut with the knife anteriorly and then we resect it. And this is the reconstruction uh, with multi-layer. Uh, and this is the video which I'm gonna skip. This patient immediately after surgery had near total resection. Uh, she still has double vision on day one, which um, uh, after five days started to improve. But after two months, she, she was able. After two months, she was able to ride horses again. And after six months, she was actually into competitive long distance endurance tests. So, um, Raja, how, how much time I still have? You, you may conclude now, Prof. Okay, so I'm going to skip all of that. And I'll say for intraaxial tumors, the expanded approaches, I don't think they offer more advantage and we still do minimally invasive transcranial. For orbital surgery, it's a new horizon. And even for intraconal uh, lesions like this one around the optic nerve, we still are able to get it uh, with careful planning. And when we label the muscles, with a sling sutures that will give us this. I will leave this maybe video for another occasion. We can look at it again. I'll move to my conclusions and I say that the minimally invasive approaches are not really an alternative or a, a threat to endoscopic. They are complementary and no one surgeon should do only one technique. We should always have a 360 tools to allow us to tackle these lesions, whatever they are in the safest way. There's lots of patient choice that should be given these days. And the decision-making depends on the honest and transparent discussion between the surgeon and the patient. Uh, and the fact that these approaches might be risky uh, means that you should think carefully before you choose them, but is not necessarily a reason to avoid them or to uh, 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 leave the surgery and abandon it. Sometimes this is a reason to improve our training and experience and might present a unique opportunity for the patient who otherwise cannot be treated well and for the surgeon to improve their technique. And um, these are the people that I'm grateful to who I trained with through the years. And I uh, would like to invite you always to attend our Neurosurgery International Master Class, which will be in November in Dubai, where we learn together and we share experiences. And uh, thank you very much for accommodating me and the battery now is uh, extremely red. So I'm very grateful, Raja, for the professors for allowing me to present. Thank you very much, Professor Ashad. Uh, one is the Q&A. Yeah, I'll read it for you. E is extended endoscopic app tumor mm -hmm. starts bleeding. What would you do? In which cases you do not advocate extended endoscopic approaches? Yes. So... Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start with the second part. The, uh, for me, the, the true contraindications are uh, first when I have a, a completely retrochiasmatic tumor, uh, maybe second when I have a, a, a very compromised carotid artery uh, with uh, incomplete circle of Willis. So if I don't have anterior communicating and posterior communicating artery and the tumor is wrapped around the carotid artery, I will probably will not try the endoscopic surgery. Um, otherwise, all the others are relative contraindications, so you you can still try. When the tumor bleeds, if it, this is tumor bleed, then you just need to continue to work systemically and devascularize the base. If you have bleeding from carotid, which is the nightmare for everyone, then really what you need to have is to pack it to the best that you can, stop the bleeding, take the patient to intervention radiology and do an angiogram and then plan with your colleague, the interventional radiologist, what you're going to do if you can stent, coil, or flow divert, or sometimes sacrifice the carotid, which is not a very pleasant thing to do. Uh, Professor Asha, uh, my question is regarding the uh, large, huge, uh, lobulated uh, pituitary adenoma uh, surgical approach. You mentioned about the extended uh, or expanded approach, and... Uh, the other approach, uh, we sometimes use the combined approach, uh, cranial and uh, transphenoidal uh, simultaneously 
Have you ever done the uh, combined approach is transcranial and transplenoidal uh, uh, simultaneously? No, um, no I, I'm, I'm aware of it. I've always been anxious the fact that transpenoidal approaches are clean but not sterile approaches and uh-huh. transcranial are, are sterile. So uh, for me, it's a logistical challenge that you need two separate trays, two separate instruments, uh, and um, uh, you need almost to finish here and close and remove everything and sterilize again. Uh, so I did not do it sm- simultaneously. Uh, I tried to get everything endoscopically, and when I failed, I came another day, and according to the images, I decided either to go purely transcranial, or in the case that I have shown, I found the tumor has come down uh, after a day or two with the CSF drainage and with the gravity, and maybe try again uh, endoscopically. But it's obviously a well-prescribed technique to work together. For me, the worry is going to be about infection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But uh, sometimes the uh, from the dual adenoma, the intra-tumoral uh, bleeding occurs. So, uh, so we do simultaneously the concept. Uh, sometimes uh, you you mentioned about infection is the uh, important things. Okay, do you have uh, any questions from the audience on the Q and A? Yes, Doctor Habibulo asks. If there is hyperostosis of tuberculum and you experience profuse bleeding from the bone, what do you do? And the second is, what is the tactic for vasospasm prevention and post-op management for patients with small blood clot in the third, fourth ventricle and signs of one-sided carotid spasm after surgery? So, a vasospasm is a true problem and it's probably underestimated. Um, but we have seen it a real phenomena that, especially with... with um, things such as delayed visual deterioration or delayed hypopituitarism and DI. The the reason usually is due to vasospasm. Um, Now, obviously, you can put a a, a papaverin in the area after you finish, uh, but you have to keep an eye on the patient clinically and treat it like any other vasospasm with hypertensive therapy and patient will be in ICU. Um, there isn't much else you can do. O- obviously, the manipulation itself has been suggested to be a reason, so you need to be very delicate. But that goes for endoscopic or microscopic surgery, it's the same. The bleeding from hyperostosis. Uh, now, you've got to remember that um, the bone bleeds because uh, you uh, have opened it. So by the time you remove, you remove all bone, when you do the drilling complete, it will stop. And there are so many... Uh, adjuvants for uh, uh, hemostasis these days um, that you can use these adjuvants, flow seal, T seal, and and so the like. So I did not find that to be an issue. The bleeding that is annoying is from the cavernous sinus itself or from the intercavernous sinus. And the technique to inject flow seal directly into the sinus for the cavernous or to coagulate the intercavernous sinus early or even use clips on it sometimes uh, that would save you lots of time and hustle. Thank you. So time is up. Thank you, Professor. See Thank you, you very much. It was indeed a very wonderful session. Amazing cases we had about extended endoscopic approaches. Thank you very much for teaching us. I would like to mention that this has been broadcasted on WeChat, YouTube and Zoom. And as of now, we have around 325 people who have logged in from different parts of the world. We are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for the help. And now we'll move on to the second session. Oh, no, yes. Uh, I mean, that's the, the last talk was amazing. Uh, it was a very, very nice talk. Uh, Mohamed, really expert. So thank you again for this invitation. But the last talk, come on, amazing cases, amazing uh, resolution. Um, very, very clear. Thank you very much. So I, I will share the screen of uh, Prof. Okama's lecture. Thank you for the chance to speak in ACNS. My name is Yohei Hokama from Ryukyus. Ryukyus a small island group, Okinawa Prefecture in Japan. I'm grateful to meet you as a member of Asia. Now, start the lecture. Contents are below. Preoperative planning is important for surgery. And white matter bundles has some crucial cognitive domains. 
In this lecture, first, I present you the original pre-operative structural planning methods, and then, present cases with this planning and tract graphy. And last, I would like to suggest that the plasticity of white matter integrity through the rodent and human being study. The preoperative structural planning means let the computer predict the microscopic views that include regional, cortical, vascular, and bony information before surgery. For an example, if you see such a temporal region, you may be able to resect without difficulty. However, the planning helps you reach the target more easily. This is the creating process of the planning. The conventional CT and MR images were integrated and structures of interest were extracted with trace or cut command. Then, the three-dimensional reconstructed model was outputted. The working display running on the software Synapse Vincent Fujifilm Japan. The video. The anterior temporal artery and curved inferior trunk tell me the place of the tumor. Region was resected. The diagnosis was diffuse large B cell lymphoma. This is comparison of the structural planning image with real operating field. There were no need for navigation system. Same manner. The region of the eloquent area, the oligodendroglioma IDH mutant was sampled for the pathological diagnosis without functional deficits. The gadolinium enhanced parahippocampal region was also totally dissected through inferior temporal root. The diagnosis was anaplastic astrocytoma. Another case, the pathological diagnosis of the sub-superior frontal cervical region was demyelinating disease, sampled without ovary section. The HE staining shows macrophage infiltration. Inset indicates closed spelt cell. In summary of four cases, the structural signs of cortex, arteries, veins, and bone in this planned images were anatomically precise, comparing with real operative field. And the plan inheriting the approach angle, so the geometrical relationship generate the target region in mind automatically to the actual viewing. So these structural plannings were adapted from June 2013 to present. The total number of cases were 465 for 9 years. The 88% were for the intracranial regions. The graph shows personal changes of number of annual surgeries. The vertical axis is number of surgeries and the horizontal is Western calendar. Recently, the blue dotted graph, the cases surgery with preoperative structural planning is almost same as the light blue graph, total number of surgeries. I believe the efficacy of the plan for daily clinical use. Next, about white matter bundles. These are common fibers. Each bundle has a representative function. 
it's important to note that there are no one-to-one -one correspondence between a white matter tract and cognitive domain. Now, shows the five cases with this structural planning and use image of tractography about white matter bundles. First, presents a 30 years old female patient with subacute hemorrhage of the left medulla cavernous malformation. The right hemiplegia and gait disturbance were delayed, and she decided to undergo surgery through the transolivary route. The corticospinal tract of right and left were shifted to contralateral side of the region. That penetrates itself, so we adapted transolivary approach. The dorsal exophytic region was dissected simultaneously. The video. The actual. Sagittal section. The spinal root and pica are the landmarks of the safe entry zone. First, dorsal exophytic region was dissected. The mulberry like mass was removed. And gliotic layer was appeared. The safe entry zone at the expanding medulla was detected. And slight incision shows the bark beneath the parenchyma. Piecemeal fashion resection was undergone through the 5 mm corridor. Small bud, nostril, The monitoring responses were intact. The post-operative MRI revealed total dissection of the mass regions. The comparison of the preoperative structural planning image with the actual microscopic viewing. The change of symptoms. The gait of preoperative state was slow and unsteady. Two weeks after surgery, she walked fast, able to up and down stairs. Afterwards, the number of fibers and the average of FA, fractional anisotropy value of the corticospinal tracts, 
were both increased in bilateral side, the integrity of the bundles may be modulated by mass reduction effect of surgery and led to the improvement of the gait function. The next patient is adult female with increased intracranial pressure head weight and right hemiplegia. The image investigation revealed the 70 mm intrinsic frontal lobe tumor and she received the operation. The preoperative structural image planning pointed the superficial feeding artery from the left ACA not passing the tumor. The dominant hemisphere was bilateral and the frontal aslant tract domain of the language was beside the tumor. That should be care in the operation. The tumor was expanding and spilled out. Five are fluorescent the mass region. Anchor to the depths. Resect the superficial feeding point. Confirm the border. Care the frontal aslan tract. Prefrontal artery. Open the teeth at the posterior end of the tumor. Depths. The top bulk was removed. The fluorescence was disappeared. The MRI shows the residual. Further resection was started. The remnant raised that was elastic. Trimmed. and over. The chemoradiation therapy was performed and initial control was acceptable. She returned home without neurological deficits include language. The third case. The patient initiated Symptomatic epilepsy and image examination shows 90 mm right front temporal glioma. By the diffusion tensile tractography, the anterior ceramic radiation and uncinate fasciculus domain of memory and executive function were shifted by mass region. The dominant hemisphere was contralateral side. The tumor involved two lobes, so removed partially to preserve the cognitive functions. The fourth case. The young girl with history of developmental disorders complained increased intracranial pressure headache. Image examination reveals the left trigonal tumor and hydrocephalus. We planned trans inferior temporal root. Trans parietal root was too far to the target and dominant left side persuades the decision. The root avoid inferior longitudinal fasciculus, the domain of executive function. The video. Positioning.
Anchor the guide to. The pen dimmer was dissected and the tumor appeared. Originated to colloid plexus. Sample. And dissected. Withdraw the hidden region. Ventricular wall was surveyed much closely. The region was removed totally, and she discharged after subsequent placement of ventricular peritoneal shunt. Eventually, ICP symptoms were relieved. Cognitive function had been no remarkable change. The last case. The adult female patient complains gradually emphasizing headache and had recent memory disturbance for three weeks. MRI investigation demonstrated 71 mm mass region besides the right tribune. The Fiesta image depicted the feeder free at the inferior horn. That is part of the anterior colloidal artery. The preoperative structural planning image shows the artery feed only the region and not pass through to the surrounding brain tissues. The whole range of the tumor and shown the predicted strict ligate point of the feeder at the inferior horn. The light transmitter temporal route was approved that did not conflict to the acute fasciculus domain of the language. And also, the planned incision point had no response of the functional tasks. The video. That's the point. The feeder was trapped and dissected. Thin medial wall of the ventricle was opened. And the mass appeared. Developing with four hands. Dissecting the plan circumferentially. Purchase the border. The vessels coagulate and the depth. The last remnant was detached. This is T1 gadolinium enhanced MRI at the 24 hours after operation. Gross total dissection was achieved. In the diffusion weighted images, no high intensity area was observed.
She recovered immediately and had no aphasia. The comparison of the planning image with actual viewing. The feeding artery was observed beside the hippocampus. The pathological diagnosis was meningocerial meningioma. And 15 months follow up MRI shows no relapse of the tumor. The summary. Four of five cases were semi-urgent, presenting symptoms of increased ICP. To note, the information derived from tractographies led to the acceptable transcortical or transparenchymal surgical corridor, avoiding the critical corticospinal tract or language dominance, such as arcuate fasciculus and inferior longitudinal fasciculus. Furthermore, that also helped dissection with consistent care to the surrounding other cognitive territories, like frontal aslan tract, anterior ceramic radiation, inferior front occipital fasciculus, uncinate fasciculus. Subsequently, all patients were reinstatement after the operation. The last topic is the study about the integrity of the white matter bundles. The study suggests that the integrity of the white matter bundles damaged by cranial radiation may be recovered through the hyperbaric oxygen therapy and administration of memantine, an NMDA receptor antagonist. The background. This is the serial images of a huge frontal GBM with CSF dissemination. Applied neoadjuvant chemoradiation therapy, followed by salvage surgery, the tumor was controlled and survived over more than 14 years. Indeed, the patient is a long survivor. It takes about four years to return previous work. Note, ventricular dilatation started during the radiation therapy, which may influence on the executive function. So, although the radiation therapy is an important treatment option for the malignant tumors of the central nervous system, it caused the brain atrophy from the beginning. And the therapy are known to be produced white matter damage, which can lead to cognitive decline in patients. Therefore, the mission is to overcome this problem. We focused on the hyperbaric oxygen therapy as a possible intervention to promote cognitive recovery. It had been reported to develop regeneration of peripheral nerve cysts by reducing inflammatory cytokines. In addition, hyperbaric oxygen therapy has already been utilized in our institution to treat malignant tumors of the central nervous system, according to the principle that oxygenated tumors retain increased radiosensitivity. And a phase two trial reported a median survival time of 113 months for grade 3 tumors and 70 months for grade 4. Lessons. Then, the rodent study was performed based on the human treatment for 5 days. These were 5 groups control cranial radiation only, cranial radiation plus HBO, cranial radiation plus memantine, and cranial radiation plus both HBO and memantine. Total dose of cranial radiation was 10 gray, 2 gray per fraction. HBO was performed 2 atoms for 14 minutes per time. Memantine was administered 5 mg per kilogram per day. Afterwards, the pathological features of the white matters and cognitive function were checked out 
in, in this visual group. Result. The upper panel shows cerebral section of the rodent. White matter components were squared and enlarged in lowers. Anyway, to know, the radiation caused the reduction of the axons compared to control. The expression of the myelin basic protein was also decreased. Focused on the radiation plus HBO, the axons were exhibited and the luminescence of MVP was maintained compared to radiation only. Radiation plus memantine also had the same trend. The result of the semi-quantitative analysis of MVP expression and morphometry of axonal lengths. Radiation decreased the MVP expression compared to control. Then, radiation plus memantine and radiation plus HBO increase the MVP expression compared to radiation only. The axonal lengths also indicate the same pattern. The axonal length was defined as axonal length divided by maximum radius of the cell body. To assess the anxiety-like behavior, used the elevated plasmase experiments. The animal has a nature of aversion to open space and tendency to be sigmotaxis. Focused on the open arm, the time spent and visiting frequency to the open arm were higher in irradiated mice and modulated by plus memantine, HBO, and both memantine and HBO. The pattern separation ability, spatial working memory, were tested using a delayed non-matching to place task protocol in a radial arm maze, in which the angle between the sample and reverse were varied during the experiment as separation 1 to 3. As a result, the radiation tend to reduce the percent of correct choice, but not significant. Next is human analysis. We investigated whether cranial radiation affects human cerebral white matter bundles and cognitive function, and analyzed whether intervention with hyperbaric oxygen therapy or memantine administration could modify the effect. The study period was from April 2011 to December 2020, and neuropsychological tests and diffusion tensor images were examined before and after radiation therapy or the patient with malignant tumors of the central nervous system. The hyperbaric oxygen therapy is expected to improve the therapeutic effects, so it was basically performed, and patients were randomized to take memantine, 5 mg per day. We got approval of the University of the Ryukyu's ethic committee. The evaluation of white matter bundles were performed with DTI-derived quantitative parameter as FA, MD, AD, and RD. If the neural axons of white matter bundle is well myelinated, the FA fractional anisotropy may be increased. And the eight white matter bundles contralateral to the region were selected to exclude the mass effect and surgery. For an example, 
the patient of left temporal glioma, white matter bundles at contralateral right orange circle area were assessed. The cognitive function was scoring by neuropsychological test. Results. There were 24 patients complete the irradiation therapy and examinations around the treatment. Irradiation only were three cases. Irradiation with HBO were 11 cases and irradiation with both HBO plus memantine were 10 cases. This is comparison results of the DTI-derived parameters of the individual white matter bundles between pre- and post-irradiated state. The vertical axis is the value of FA or other parameters, and horizontal axis is the name of individual white matter bundles. The upper is radiation-only group, and middle is irradiation with HBO. The lower is irradiation with both HBO and memantine. To note, there were one or three white matter bundles that got increased the FA value in the group treated with HBO or both HBO and memantine, despite of the ionizing radiation effect. Enlarged view. Mean FA value of the corticospinal tract was increased in both HBO group and HBO plus memantine group. Especially in, with HBO plus memantine group, the mean FA value of anterior ceramic radiation and syndrome hippocampal part, the domain of executive function were increased. This is the individual qualitative presentation. These are serial tractography images of the light white matter bundles in adult male patients operated due to the left temporal anaplastic astrocytoma and received irradiation therapy total 56 gray with HBO plus memantine. To remark, the anterior ceramic radiation was appeared in post irradiation state. The orange one. In this patient, the FA values were increased in six of seven bundles, except for anterior ceramic radiation. While take into consideration that the ATR was emerged after the therapies. This is the neuropsychological test results. To note, the digit symbol test score that reflect the executive function was increased in treated with HBO and memantine group. About digit symbol test, it consists of digit symbol pairs followed by the list of digits. Under each digit, the subject should write down the corresponding symbol as fast as possible. The number of correct symbols within the allowed time is measured. Summary of the study. In rodent, radiation impaired white matter myelination and declined attention. HBO or memantine restored both. In human, HBO plus memantine increased the integrity of several white matter bundles and promoted the executive function despite cranial radiation. So we suggest the HBO and memantine may recover white matter integrity and cognitive function from the radiation damage. Conclusion Preoperative planning is vital. Preoperative structural planning with tractography or functional MRI lead adequate surgical corridor. Finally, the integrity of white matter bundle is modulated dramatically not only by surgery, but also changed with hyperbaric oxygen therapy and memantine. Thank you for watching. I, I am uh, surprised about the incidence about the memantine. Uh,
oxygenatory uh, therapy. But the MEMAN team, I want to ask about uh, how much uh, is the graduation, uh, how long time is the treatment about the, I mean, with the MEMAN team, and in which moment uh, we can decide to um, the instauration of the of the supply uh, of the memantine in the patient after radiation. That is my question. The duration of the memantine administration. Okay, uh, the patient received memantine uh, five milligram per day for uh, initial radio chemoradio therapy period. Yes, and, uh, five milligrams. But which, which is the time uh, when you decide to start the treatment? Where, which time you decide? After the, the radiotherapy or even in the middle of the treatment? In which moment you you think is the best moment to start the treatment with Memanti? From the start of the chemo radiation. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Hokama that uh, when you operated the uh, medullary lesion with uh, the dorsal exophytic lesion. There was one more lesion down at the C34 level. Did you consider operating it uh, on that c single stage? We considered the medullary lesion was symptomatic uh, primarily, but uh, the uh, dorsal exophytic lesion, also the possibility of the uh, future symptomatic. So, um, in this operation, we can reach um, both uh, regions. So we decided uh, simultaneously dissection is the best choice for uh, her life. Okay, thank you. Prof Kurosaki, would you like to ask something? Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, you presented so nice, beautiful uh, play opera table uh, images. Uh, my question is, can you edit a uh, preoperative image applied to the navigation system? Ah. Okay, of course, we uh, checked a uh, neural navigation system in the operation, almost all cases. Thank you, thank you very much. So if there are no further queries, Prof. Uh, Max, would you like to say the concluding remarks? Thank you for this opportunity to share. We have more cases, but for the next time, I think can be sure. possible. Definitely. I think it's time we'll wind this up. Uh, I'll close this officially. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Prof. Yoko Kato, I'd like to thank uh, both the speakers of today, uh, Prof. Mohammed Al Asha and uh, Prof. Yohei Hokama, as well as the chairs, Prof. Masamichi Kurosaki and Prof. Uh, Maximiliano Nunes for the time and support for the ACNS webinar. So until we all meet online tomorrow, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.